Hi, and welcome to KHN's Facebook Live Chat. Today we're talking about the prescription drug pricing pipeline and also just the overall high cost of drugs today. Uh, if you have a question, please post it to our Facebook page. I'm Stephanie Stapleton, an editor here at Kaiser Health News, and this is Julie Appleby, one of our senior correspondents. Um, just to get started, Julie, why don't you give us an overview of how this system works? Okay, thank you. Um, if there's two things, Stephanie, you want to take away from this is A, it's really complicated, and B, there's a lot of players, and these are often multi-billion dollar companies, so there's a lot of players in this system. So let me walk you through it, um, and it is a little complicated, so hang in there. So first of all, we have the drug makers. They develop the drug over a period of years, um, not all drugs make it to market, right? But once they do, the drug makers can then set a price, a, a list price. It's also sometimes called average wholesale price. But so the drug makers set the price. And then other companies, these are also large companies, come along, they're wholesalers, and they purchase the drug from the drug makers, generally at a discount off that list price. So they pay less than the list price. So the wholesalers have the drug. And then the wholesalers sell that drug to the pharmacies. And the pharmacies generally pay a little bit more than what the wholesalers paid, so because the wholesalers have to make some money, uh, the distribution system as well, so the pharmacies buy the drug. And then that's where you, the patient, come in and you go to your pharmacy and you pick up your prescription. So let's just talk about insured patients. They generally pay some kind of a copayment, which could be a flat dollar amount or it could be a percentage of the cost of the drug. So. They pay that to the pharmacy, their copayment. And then how does the pharmacy get reimbursed for the rest of it? That's where groups called pharmacy benefit managers generally come along. And these are companies that are contracted usually by insurers or sometimes employers directly to handle those kinds of things, the claims and make the payments. And so they pay the pharmacy for the drug, usually also a, a small dispensing fee as well. And then they, in turn, charge their client for that drug. So they then go to the insurer or the employer and say, hey, we just paid out this. We're going to collect this money back from you. Um, they are very large companies, and they make their money in a variety of ways, including you know, administrative fees, um, the difference in what they pay the pharmacy and what they charge the employer sometimes, um, and rebates. And we can talk about that later. But that, in a nutshell, is the distribution system, and these are very large companies for the most part. So just to step back for a minute, do drugs really cost more in the U.S. than they didn't do in other places around the world? Um, yes, they do. We, we have um, a variety of reasons for that. So yes, in the United States, we spend about two times more than per person on drugs than almost any other in industrialized country, than any other industrialized country. Um, and spending, remember, is a sort of function of both price and how much we take, but a lot of it is driven by branding prices. So we spend about twice as much as other countries, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, a couple of the big ones are we, um, we don't set prices in this country. The, the government does not set prices. Uh, and we also have patent protection to reward those drug makers for developing drugs. They get a certain period of time on the market where they have the exclusive rights to that drug. And so they have a longer period of time when they may be the only one on the market with, with a product for that particular condition or that particular drug. Okay. So those are two of the reasons why we do spend a little bit more than other countries. Okay. Well, I'm going to switch gears for a minute because we've got a question from one of our readers. Um, Heather from Alabama asks... Everyone says gen generics should keep prices low, but she says she pays more for her generic insulin, and she just wants to know what's up with that. Do you have any thoughts on this and other issues regarding generics versus right, the brand right. name drugs? This is really interesting, and Heather is right. She is paying more for her insulin. Insulin prices have gone way up. There's, it's very interesting because there's a lot of competition. There's newer and better insulins coming on the market. That's part of the reason. Some of the generic so the pricing has also gone up. In general, generic drugs are less expensive than brand names by a lot. And nine out of 10 prescriptions in this country are for generics. But recently we've seen some generic prices go up considerably. Not all, many generic prices have actually lowered, but some generic prices have gone up in recent years. And sometimes that's a function of um, maybe it, there's only one product on the market. Maybe there's only a couple of manufacturers. and. There's other times when there's a lot of competition and it's just they're raising prices because they can. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to step back again to the pipeline mm -hmm. and to how all of these 
stakeholders work together or have pieces along the way. I mean, how much do they actually make out of this system and, and how do they divvy up that pie? You know, this is also sort of a point of contention. There's always contention in this industry, but there are various studies that have looked at this. So in general, if you're looking at gross revenue, about two thirds of the gross revenue in the pipeline goes to the drug maker. And that leaves about a third that goes to those other entities, the wholesalers, the pharmacies, and the PBMs. But if you look at net, and that's after they've paid you know, taxes and research and development and marketing and that kind of thing, the net is a little bit different, but it's a similar breakdown. So I was looking at a study by um, USC Schaefer Center, and I was talking with the author just yesterday, but um, uh, for every, he, he explained this way, for about, for every hundred dollars spent on drugs, and then we're talking brand and, and generic, okay? So for every hundred dollars, about 23 is net profit. And of that, most of it goes to the drug maker, about $15 out of that 23. But insurers, PBMs, pharmacies, and wholesalers all get a little piece of that as well. And that's the net profit. So that's kind of an overview. He also noted that, um, again, if we're talking about those net profits, brand name drug makers, he said, are the most profitable industry in the country. And now some other folks might dispute that, but according to his study, brand name drug makers are most net profitable, and that's above tobacco, alcohol, that kind of thing. But they also have some some large research and development expenses. But we're talking about net profits here, so that's that was an interesting study. Okay, we have um, another question from, I guess, somebody who's tuned into our Facebook Live chat here, and um, it's from Thomas, who gets great kudos because he's mentioning the. Kaiser Health News graphic called a pipeline to profit, which Julie actually did. So that's really kind of cool. Anyway, he mentions that, and this builds on this profit discussion we were just having. Um, the on the chart, there's a surprisingly low profit to pharmacies, uh, about fourteen dollars on a two hundred and fifty dollar sale. And he wants to mm -hmm. know if this is generally the case with pharmacy profits, or mm -hmm. kind of how can you fill that in for him. Pharmacy profits are also very complicated. So that chart was about brand name drugs. And in that case, pharmacies don't make a lot of profit on the brand name drugs. That mainly goes to the drug maker. Uh, pharmacies are paid in a variety of ways. So with generic drugs, they are getting, uh, they're paying out the money, right, for the drug. They're buying it from the wholesaler and then they're reimbursed. And they're reimbursed by the pharmacy benefit manager and they have their list of prices that they pay that they negotiate with these pharmacies as a maximum allowable amount that they get back. And that same study I spoke about yesterday from USC Schaefer showed that, again, for brand name drugs, pharmacies don't make a whole lot of money, but on the generics, they do have a larger net margin. And it's still not a lot, but it's a little bit larger. Um, pharmacists sometimes complain, however, that they are paid less than what they're paying out for some generic drugs based on these maximum allowables. So there's there's some fluctuation. They may make more money on one drug and, and lose money on another. And they also get a small dispensing fee. So it's really complicated. And again, it depends on whether it's a brand name drug or generic drug. But this is, again, a point of some tension between pharmacists and uh, pharmacy benefit management companies. Well, that kind of gets at what my next question was going to be anyway, because we've talked about all of these different stakeholders, and I wondered how much tension is there between them, and, and how does that come up? Where do we see that? Uh, you're seeing it a little bit more now. There's, it's been in the news. Um, remember last year we had the Mylan CEO talk about EpiPen and the price? Mm -hmm. And in one of um, her statements, she talked about how about half the cost of the EpiPen went to middlemen, you know, pharmacy benefit managers, pharmacies, insurers, that type of thing. That was, there was some pushback on that, but whether that was the exact right number or not, but that's come up. So the tensions are, as I mentioned, between pharmacies, as particularly the independent pharmacies and these pharmacy benefit managers, because PBMs, have contracts with them. They set up these networks of pharmacies. They decide on the reimbursement. So there's some tension there between those groups. There is also other tension. So PBMs and drug makers, for example. Um, drug makers have said that some of the efforts by PBMs, and particularly around rebates, tend to keep list prices, prices higher. And we can explain that a little bit. So there's a little bit of a pushback on some of these rebates. So the drug makers say, well, because we're, we're needing to offer these rebates, 
we're keeping the list price higher, but the pharmacy benefit managers point mm -hmm. right back at the drug makers and say it's the drug makers that are setting the price in the first right. place. And I want to stop you there because mm -hmm. I want you to explain what these rebates, these rebates are, are and yeah, how they, they work. They are, they, are, they are very interesting. So a rebate, think about when you go to the store, sometimes you have a, I don't know, coupon for if you buy a certain kind of soap or something and you and you mail it in and you get a little $3 check back later, right, for, mm -hmm. for having purchased that product. This is a similar type of thing. Um, a, a pharmacy benefit managers negotiate with drug makers to get a rebate off the price of some drugs and they get that money back later off the list price. The rebate helps the uh, drug maker get on what are called a formulary or preferred spot on the formulary. And these are lists of drugs that your insurer covers and in, usually in categories like generic, brand, preferred. And the drug makers want to be on that preferred list. So they will offer a rebate in some cases to make sure they stay on that, that list. And the rebates, um, the pharmacy benefit managers say that this saves a lot of money for the system because it's off the list price. Critics have argued that, you know, it keeps the list price kind of high and maybe even going higher because if it's a percentage off that list price, the rebate gets larger the higher the list price, right? So that has been some debate over that as well. Um, consumers don't necessarily see the rebate directly. It's not like when you walk up, you know, to buy your drug at the counter that you get that rebate. In fact, most of the time you don't, you do not. What pharmacy benefit managers say is that this has saved $127 billion or so over the last year in terms of lower list prices that then is sunk back into keeping premiums lower for the following year, maybe lower deductibles, that type of thing. So the consumer may not see it directly, but they argue that um, the money does actually save consumers money in the long run. But it's also a little unclear exactly how much that is and how much these rebates are in general because it's fairly closely held um, within the PBMs. They don't want to tell, they say they don't want to tell their competitors how much of a rebate they're getting for a particular drug. So, so it's not always clear how much, how much that is. Um, the pharmacy benefit managers can keep all or part of that rebate. They say they pass most of it back to their employer groups and sometimes they pass 100% of it back. Sometimes the employer groups have decided or the insurers have decided they don't want the rebate. They want to pay for the pharmacy management services another way. So again, that varies based on the thing, but mm -hmm. it's one source of revenue for the PBMs. Okay, got it. And um, if you've just tuned in, I'm Stephanie Stapleton and this is Julie Appleby and you're watching a KHN Facebook Live chat about prescription drug pricing. Um, if you have a question, please post it to our Facebook page. Um, and my next question for you, Julie, is kind of what's happening, what, what does government do to control costs or to get into this pipeline? Well, it varies depending on the program. So in Medicare, for example, Medicare is actually expressly forbidden from setting prices so they don't they do not set prices and and they are also f covered a fairly broad formulary it means they have to cover a lot of different drugs so they can't really sort of pick and choose and try to play the drug makers off against each other as much as you can in private insurance so the government doesn't do that there but in Medicaid drug makers have to offer Medicaid programs what's called the best price and that's mm -hmm. like the amount equal to or less than what anybody else is getting so Medicaid has a little bit of a discount and then if you look at the veterans um, health program they have a fairly small list of drugs they cover and that's how they try to control costs they have a limited formulary and so they also get lower prices than perhaps private uh, sector folks so if that's what you mean with the current programs that's what they're doing right now mm -hmm. what about you know since drug costs have been so much in the news lately. What's happening in Congress? I mean, are, are, are members of Congress focused on this issue? Are they starting to talk about it or advance well, you advancing know, we, bills? We've had hearings, especially last year over the whole EpiPen thing, right, where there was a lot of discussion about health prices. We've had the president talking about how something has to be done. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, but not a lot of action. There has been some movement on speeding generics to market, making it a little bit faster to get generics on. Because once a generic comes on, the price goes down for that that category of drugs, right? Because generics are less expensive than it. So we're seeing some action around that. But there's some discussion of other things. So we're hearing a lot 
sort of like evergreen kind of things, right? So we always hear about importing drugs from other com countries. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can all buy our drugs from Canada. Critics say that may not work too well. It's kind of like a hippo on the back of a squirrel, right? Because you've got this great big country, United States, can we really buy all our drugs from somewhere else? So that's one of the debates is, would that even work? There's been questions raised about would it be safe? Would be, how would we know we're getting legitimate drugs? But that, that will continue to be a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some discussion about allowing Medicare to negotiate prices, but again, that hasn't gone real far. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't see a whole lot of action this year on, on that, frankly, in Congress. There's been some action in the states. Well, that was yeah. going to be my next question for you. Some states are doing some things, and it's generally around like transparency. So some some of the some of the state rules they want to know if a if a drug goes up more than say 15 percent, they want this drug maker to try to justify. Well, what are the reasons for that? Uh, Vermont had something like that. In New York, they um, put a cap on their Medicaid spending. They said if if Medicaid spending it looks like it's going to go above this cap, they then want the drug makers to justify their prices in a way or offer additional discounts to the to the Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. That one's fairly new. We'll see how that plays out. So states are kind of um, looking at those types of things. Okay. Well, now we have a question from Jennifer. And she'd like you to talk, Julie, a bit more about why drugs are so much more expensive in the U.S. than they are in other countries. And specifically, she she wants to know if this means that we, you know, consumers here are subs subsidizing the costs that people pay in other places around the world. That's one of the things that we hear a lot, that, that yes, we do pay more. We're helping pay those R&D costs because, you know, think about it, it's really expensive to, to, to develop a drug. So the drug makers argue that they need that money to continue to be innovative and that type of thing. Um, so America does pay more than other countries. Critics have said, well, why should we be subsidizing? I mean, there's this debate that's been going on forever. But the bottom line is, Jennifer, she's absolutely right, we do pay more for drugs in this country. And again, there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, we don't have price controls. We don't want, I mean, America has long said we don't want price controls. That may change someday, but right now that's what, what where it's at. Drug makers can set the price of their drugs at what they think the market will bear. Uh, they can raise those prices generally. They are, they can't all get together and agree, like collude, hey, we're all gonna raise our prices, that would be antitrust and they could run into trouble and we've seen some, some concerns raised about that. So they can't do that, but they can set the price at what the market will bear. We also have, like I said, patent protection that, that for new brand name drugs, they get essentially a monopoly for a while. They can, they can sell the drug without competition until generics start to come on. So those are two of the big reasons why our costs are higher than other countries. Okay. Now we also have a question from Georgia, which kind of gets at a question I wanted to ask too. Um, she'd like you to discuss why many um, oncology drugs well, for so many of the oncology drugs that are on the market right now, the generic versions have actually increased the prices. Hmm. You know, I haven't actually looked at that that closely, so I'm not sure I can answer that question. But in general, competition is supposed to lower prices, but that doesn't always work out in this market. So you can look at, I mean, there's a lot of drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and the prices have kept going up. Um, there are a lot of drugs for multiple sclerosis and prices are high. We've seen insulin going up. So competition in and of itself is clearly not driving down prices. Now, sometimes it does. Look at the hep C, right? Remember mm -hmm. when hep C came on the market a couple years ago? It's a new drug. It cures, it cures hep C. So that was a big advance. But these pills were $1,000 a pill when they first came on the market. And then a couple more came on the market. Other brand companies came in with their treatments for hepatitis C and these pharmacy benefit managers kind of pitted one against another and said you know what we'll put you on our formulary but not you in terms of driving the price down and they actually succeeded in that and now those drugs are last time I checked was about $500 a pill so the price has come down quite a bit and that's an example where competition spurred by sort of these formulary lists did drive the price down but that doesn't always happen. Now, you recently wrote a story about a drug called Spinraza, mm -hmm. which I think raised a lot of really interesting issues about h how these really expensive drugs kind of set up real pressures in the marketplace among the insurers and Medicaid and the coverage decisions. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a really interesting drug. It's a, it's a condition... Um, 
to, it, it's a drug called Spinraza. It treats spinal muscular dystrophy, which is a fairly rare condition that mainly affects infants and young children, and it's really awful, devastating disease. And so this offers um, hope to a lot of parents. It works for many of those kids, not all of them, but it does seem to help, but it's also very expensive. It's an what's called an orphan drug, meaning there's not a lot of um, folks that are gonna take it, so the price is a little higher for that generally, but this was really opened a lot of people's eyes because it was $750,000 for a year's treatment. Now that price drops by about half the second year because the kids need fewer injections the second year, but that's expensive, and so this has created, insurers are looking at, okay, which patients are going to get this, which ones are not. They have to do this balancing act. And then Medicaid, it's the same thing. Medicaid is the insurance program for low-income families. And then there's private insurers. They're all kind of wrestling with this. And they've created different rules in varying states. So in some states, kids on ventilators can't get this drug covered by their uh, insurer. In other states, they can. Uh, so there's just this variety, but I think this shows the pressure on some of these plans to try to figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to cover it, how they're going to pay for it. We saw something similar with Hep C. When Hep C first came out, some of the Medicaid programs said that they would cover it once a patient had actual liver damage. And that raised a lot of concerns and some lawsuits, and that changed, and so, so more patients are now getting those drugs. But, but, but these are expensive products. They're very useful products. They're very helpful for a lot of people. But, but a lot of these insurers are trying to figure out, can they set some parameters around uh, who is going to get them and when? Got it. Um, now we've got another question. Uh, Bobby wants to know if it's possible to explain within the pharmacy supply chain, what is the profit distribution between pharma the wholesaler, the PBM, and the pharmacy? That's a good question, that is a good Bobby. Question. There's, there's, there's a lot of um, discussion about that. There's been a number of studies. I, I looked at one yesterday. I can only kind of talk about that one. But, but in this um, study by USC Schaefer Center, and it's online. They can, you can look it up there. But um, the distribution, the net profits, overall distribution in the industry, if you spend $100 on a drug, brand and generic, they combined them, the net profits would be about $15 to the drug maker, about $3 to the insurer, about $2 to the PBM, and about $3 to the pharmacies, and 32 cents to the wholesalers. So that's just one study, but that's kind of showing there, there is a distribution. It's a little bit different with brand versus generic, and that study goes into that, but this is a combined, you know, the mm -hmm. brand and generic. Right. Now, Julie, this is, I'm kind of interested, because consumers, I mean, obviously, they're the people that they deal with all of this mm -hmm. in the end. And I've heard you talk before about what they can do to kind of control their out-of-pocket exposure. Can you talk about that again for us? So consumers, when you go to the pharmacy counter, let's just talk about an insured consumer. Or um, You have generally a copayment you make, which could be a flat dollar amount, right? It could be 5 bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, or it could be a percentage of the cost of the drug. 20, 30, 50 percent in some cases, and you also have a deductible. So all of these play into into the equation, right? So if it's a flat dollar copay, it's pretty much that's what it's going to be. You can ask at the pharmacy counter, if I paid cash, would this be less than my copay? And in some cases it might be, and in some cases they might be able to tell you that. Now some of the pharmacy groups say that they're not allowed to talk about that based on their contracts. Um, there's some dispute about that too, but it's always worth asking, Is it? would it be less if I paid cash? Um, the only problem with paying cash is then it might not count towards your deductible. Now if you're paying a percentage of the cost, that's where it does get a little more complicated with this list price, right? So the list price, you may be paying a percentage of that list price, but your insurer or your PBM may not actually be paying that full amount. They might get a rebate and a discount, but Generally, you're not going to get that. You're going to pay a percentage of the list price. Um, there are a couple plans. One of the PBMs called me up a while back and said, hey, we've got this new program. It's a point of sale discount where you would get an estimated rebate, but only if your employer offers that as part of your insurance package. So that's another thing consumers can do. Um, whether or not you're insured, you might just want to check around which pharmacies charge what, and there's some websites that do that, like GoodRx, Blink Health, and some of those might show you in your zip code for your particular drug how much different pharmacies are charging, and there's actually quite a range. Mm -hmm. um, 
pharmacy versus pharmacy, how much the charge might be. So it might be worth your time just to see how much it is, especially if you're in your deductible at the time. Um, and so you're paying pretty much the full amount or if you're paying a percentage of the cost of that drug. So it might be worth just shopping around whether you're insured or not to see where you might be able to get the best price. And we could talk if you want uh, about discount cards. I don't know if we've had any questions about that. We haven't. What we do have a question about right now is, um, it's a good one too, it's from Erin. She wants to know what you see in terms of the future of maintenance medications. She specifically mentions high blood pressure and diabetes medications. You know, these, these things these cost expensive. people right. their right. entire paychecks. Do you see any possible improvement there? Well, there's a couple things with those. A lot of those have been on the market for a while, so there may be a generic that might be less money, so it's always worth asking your doctor if there's a generic or even asking your pharmacist if they can substitute a generic. Um, the other thing that I think we're starting to see, maybe not necessarily with, with these drugs, but, but maybe with these drugs, are something called value-based purchasing, or, or trying to trying to encourage people to take drugs that are going to keep their overall costs low, because it really is worth it to keep people on their high blood pressure medicines, right, on their diabetes medications, so they don't have additional complications. So sometimes insurers or others drop their benefit plans to make these cost less money, and or maybe even for free to encourage people to take them because they know down the road they're saving on hospital and other costs. We're also seeing sometimes now with uh, agreements between drug makers and insurers or PBMs, something called outcomes-based payments, right? So if you have a drug that you say prevents heart, heart attacks, for example, um, you would get a payment, a certain amount of payment, and if the client's patients end up having heart attacks, you would have to give them a rebate, right? Because you said your drug does this and it doesn't. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of experimenting with those kinds of things, paying for value, paying for does it work, paying for does it work as advertised. And I think we're going to see some more of those types of efforts going forward. Mm -hmm. Now, just because you just mentioned it briefly, and we're getting close to the end of our, our time here, but I wanted to t go back to the discounts that you just mentioned. Right. There's a couple different kinds of um, discounts. So there's these, like I mentioned, GoodRx and Blink. They have they have coupons online, or sometimes your doctor gives you a coupon for a discount at the pharmacy. Um, those can be helpful to consumers. Insurers don't like them, but consumers could get a little bit of money off of, of, of their, their drug. But again, if you use those, sometimes it's considered a cash payment and it doesn't count towards your deductible. So if you know you're going to have a big deductible and you're going to, you might hit it that year, you might want your drug cost to go towards that. Insurers are concerned because they create these lists of drugs, these formulary lists with co-payments in order to try to steer people to, in some cases, the generic or in other cases, the uh, lower cost brand name drug. These uh, discount programs and co-pay assistance programs can encourage people to take other drugs than that because it's covering the cost. So they end up costing the insurer more, which they say then comes back into everybody's premium. So there's a lot of debate over these consumers really like them, but ultimately they may be adding costs to the system by encouraging people to take more expensive drugs when there's perhaps a less expensive, equally effective product available. Okay. And we have one last question also from Aaron, and this may be going a little far afield for us, but I thought we could give it a try anyway. She wants to know, um, she writes, with retail stores becoming more in danger of closing down, and I guess that's because of you know, the market pressures, will pharmacies also be affected? You know, it's hard to say. Um, pharmacies sell a lot of different products. Obviously, the retail stores, prescription drugs are part of their revenue. I think pharmacists would say the bigger concern is the independent pharmacists worry they're going to lose out to the big chain stores or to mail order. That's been a long-running concern. The, the mail order and the big chain stores say they can sometimes offer better prices. The smaller independents say they offer better customer service. So I think we're going to continue to see that debate. Uh, more people may end up on, on mail order simply because that's what their insurer requires. I, I, I hesitate to speculate on the future of whether we'll, we'll continue to have retail pharmacies. I think we right. will for some time, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, right. but she's right to wonder about that. Uh -huh. And I got to tell you, Jennifer has also asked yet another really good question. Um, she wants to know what political changes might moderate U.S. prices without moving to a single-payer system, which that's tricky. Yeah, that's, you know, again, that's really complicated. A lot of people have a lot of different ideas, and, and some that we mentioned before, some of this idea of paying for value, uh, some of the idea about maybe there's some discussion about shortening the amount of time that um, companies have a patent protection. 
that would be really controversial. There has been some effort to limit some of the ways that drug makers have tried to get around those patents. So there, there, there's been some legal cases, for example, where a uh, brand name drug maker may have been paying a generic drug ma manufacturer to stay off the market a little bit longer. That kind of thing. Those things, you know, are not supposed to happen. So, so we can see some of that. Again, I think we'll hear more discussion about should Medicare negotiate prices? Mm -hmm. uh, should we import drugs? How can we get drugs, generics on the market faster? All of those things. I think any of those three, the most likely one to happen is going to be getting generics on the market faster. Okay. And that concludes today's Facebook Live discussion. Thank you so much for sending all of these really great questions. It's really been kind of interesting yeah. and fun, I think. And if you want to learn more about these issues, I just recommend that you go check out khn.org. You can read Julie's stories there. You can also read some of the other work that our colleagues are doing on the prescription drug cost issue. Um, that would include stories by Sarah Jane Tribble and Sydney Lumpkin. And otherwise, thanks so much for spending your lunch hour with us.